Hello, everyone. This is Mr. Chung from Fenway High School with our virtual judges orientation for the Fenway Senior Science Fair. Thank you so much, first and foremost, for volunteering to judge. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, on today's video, uh, what we'll do is just run through the rubric really quickly so that you know what to expect when you're judging the seniors' presentations and what to look for as you are evaluating and participating in the final product of uh, the seniors' science fair project. So let's get started. Okay, so to start things off, let's go with uh, some reminders. Um, judging is going to start at 9 a.m., so if you can arrive at the Museum of Science by then, that would be ideal. Uh, you can get to the museum really as early as you want. Um, I think 8.30 is probably the earliest you want to be there. You're going to be standing around a lot. Um, I don't think we are going to let people down to the floor, which is the judging area, until 8.55 at the earliest. If you're driving, um, parking in the garage will be validated. Um, there will be someone at the welcome desk. So as you come in, in the lobby, there will be a welcome desk set up for you where you can check in, get situated, get your parking validated. Um, so you can uh, take care of that there. And then, like I said, judging will be between 9 and 11 a.m. When you are done, you're welcome to explore the museum on your own. Just uh, if you leave the exhibit halls, make sure that you get a hand stamp. Um, and one thing that I forgot to put on here that is uh, very important is that uh, there's no food or drink allowed in the exhibit halls. Um, when you are let in, they're going to remind you of that. But um, just a reminder, don't bring, you know, you got to finish your coffee or your snack or whatever beforehand. And if you do get there early and um, want to get something to eat, um, there's a Starbucks on site that should be open at that point. All right, so how does judging work? Um, the way it works is that all the seniors who are presenting will have been given a random number. And then after you enter the exhibit halls, you will go, there's another table to check in at um, by where the judging floor is, um, where all the students have their poster board set up. And there you'll receive a packet of rubrics and those rubrics will have random numbers on them. Those numbers are associated with random students. Um, and so you go find your student. And then when you find your student, um, they have a presentation that, that is prepared for you. Um, they will give that presentation. Um, and, you know, it's a inter you know, you can think of it. I mean, it depends on the student, but in general, it'll be an interactive presentation. Feel free to pause them if you need to ask a question, if you need some clarification. Um, you know, you don't have to, like, let them just talk at you for five to 10 minutes straight, um, feel free to ask clarifying questions as necessary, you know, as you would a normal question, um, as you would in a normal presentation. Now, for each student, you will receive a rubric for them. And that rubric is kind of your guideline about how to evaluate them, how to grade them. And uh, like I said, yeah, I'm repeating myself, but feel free to ask some questions either during or after the presentation. So what we're gonna be doing for the rest of this time is just taking a look at the rubric and seeing what you need to know, um, just things to look for. I like to think of the rubric personally as more of a guideline. You can of course use it very uh, religiously and go by the letter of the law, or you can use it as an overall guideline for how to evaluate the students. You know, we're not super, concerned with the actual grade here, although I should say that, um, you know, your evaluation does have an effect on their final grade for their science fair project. But, you know, you just want to be fair, um, ask them good questions and evaluate them accordingly um, and according to whether they have met the expectations in the rubric or not. So uh, there's multiple sections of the rubric. So let's just get to it and take a look at what you can look for in each section. Um, just kidding. <laughs> I don't know my own slides. Um, general judging guidelines. Definitely. Yeah. And this is important. Like don't expect that the students have memorized the rubric. It's a pretty extensive rubric. So if you feel like they've missed something on the rubric, please give them an opportunity to meet the rubric standards either via their board or by, via their presentation. And definitely if you feel that they've skipped something over, ask them about it and give them the chance to, demonstrate their competency, demonstrate their knowledge of that aspect of the rubric before you go ahead and evaluate them in that section of the rubric. Um, another important thing that uh, judges don't always see is the rubric is two-sided. Um, and so if you skip an entire side, it really 
kind of messes up the student's score. So please be sure to uh, flip over. Hopefully we have um, made arrows indicating to flip it over, but in case we haven't, um, please remember to do both sides of the rubric. Another thing to note is that some sections of the rubric are worth more. Um, it should be fairly clear, but if you have questions about that, find any member of the science team. Um, those will be the adults that are uh, more dressed up on the day. And um, go ahead and feel free to ask one of us about that. Um, and then the final note is the students have been told, you know, it's only two hours of judging, and the students have been told to stay by their uh, assigned tables the entire time. But of course, emergencies happen. Uh, people need to use the restroom. The general rule of thumb I would suggest is if a student is missing from their table, try a second time later. If they aren't there twice, uh, I spelled there wrong. That's kind of embarrassing. Write zero or missing um, when you turn in the rubric. And yeah, we will take care of that. And look through the magic of editing that is fixed. Although, whoops, there we go. Nope. It has been a while since I've done one of these videos, ladies and gentlemen, so I apologize. There we go. Okay, so, um, and let me move my face. So yes, um, if they aren't there, T-H-E-R-E, -E, twice, please write zero or missing when you turn in the rubric. All right, first part of the rubric is experimental design, their testable question. Um, what you're looking for is they have been taught to write their question in the format, and they, like their title and their question might be separate things, but at some point they should present to you a question in the format, how does blank affect blank? or what is the effect of blank on blank. And that right there, as, as long as they've done that, then they have clearly stated their two variables. Um, the independent variable is gonna be in this blank and then the dependent will be in the second blank. Um, and then of course, if they demonstrate, you know, sometimes they will write a little section, a little blurb, you know, if they really feel like they have solid knowledge of their testable question, you can give them five points. But as you can see here, um, as we go through the rubric, you know, each point value, there's kind of a description for what you're looking for. And like I said, you can go by this, uh, you can use it as a guideline. Um, you know, I would say if it's your first time, just go by exactly what the rubric says and, you know, give them points accordingly. So that's the testable question. You're looking for how does blank affect blank or what is the effect of blank on blank? The second section is background research. Now this is one of those double sections. Um, this is exactly how it'll look on your rubric. As you can see, it says multiply by two here. Um, obviously, if they're missing the background research, you're gonna give them zero points. Um, a four point score is they're explaining both their variables, the independent and the dependent variable, and how they relate to each other. And if you feel like they've really shown a solid understanding of the scientific concepts involved, you're gonna give them five points. And some questions you can ask yourself is, you know, does the student understand how his or her variables affect each other? Um, are they leading from their background research into their hypothesis, into their prediction for their experiment? You know, so that is kind of the goal of a good background research is to lead into your hypothesis so you can evaluate their background research accordingly. The next section is the hypothesis because the background research, as I said, naturally leads into that. Do they predict a clear outcome based on research? Does it feel like they have clearly understood and clearly explained what their prediction for their experimental result is going to be. That's, you know, the four and five point scores here. Is it based on their prior knowledge or research or do, or do they feel like they are pulling and guess out of thin air? You know, these are the questions you want to ask as you are evaluating their hypotheses. And really, if it feels like their background research is informing their hypothesis, then you should be feel comfortable giving them a strong score for their hypothesis. The next section is materials. Um, one note about materials here is that the students have been specifically warned not to list every single material because those lists can get very tedious. And so you really wanna be looking for here that they've listed the most important materials in their experiment. So for example, if they're doing a chemistry experiment, like they don't need to list that they use beakers. You know, it's just understood that uh, there are gonna be containers that they use at various times during the experiment. Um, but they should be talking about like, what is the chemical they are studying? Are they studying sodium hydroxide? Well, that should definitely be there. That is a key part, you know, that's one of their main materials. So that's what you're looking for. And, 
you know, you can press the students on this. Like, have they given any specific thought into the materials that they chose to use? Um, and if they can demonstrate that, then that's a good sign that they've put a lot of thought into what materials they needed to conduct their experiment and to learn what they were aiming to learn. All right, next is their procedure or their methods. Uh, again, they are told they should not put, you know, some students' procedures can be one and a half pages long. Obviously, that does not work well on a poster board. That's just a lot of text. So they've been told to just include their main, most important steps. And you really want to just see, like, are they giving a clear description of how they conducted their experiment and how that helped to answer their testable question? Like, is it clear how the procedure that they've come up with is going to help them answer that testable question that they started at the beginning? And so, you know, a lot of times this is one of the sections where they may talk in a lot more detail than you see on their board and definitely bear that in mind as you are evaluating them on the rubric. And the other thing to note here is, did they note a control group, a comparison group? So um, a control group is just the group that receives kind of the normal situation um, and is compared to whatever's being experimented on. Not every experiment has a control group, but if you think there should be like a normal group in their experiment, has the student noted that? Definitely um, bear that in mind as you evaluate them. Just quick example of a control group in case you're unfamiliar with the term. Let's say I did an experiment where, um, you know, you may have heard like I have three kids and they're kind of crazy. Like let's say I did an experiment to see whether, uh, I don't know, giving them caffeine uh, well, definitely makes me a bad parent, but aside from making me a bad parent, like pumping them full of caffeine, like does that raise their heart rate? Well, the control group would be taking their heart rate when they don't have any caffeine because that's their normal heart rate. And then, you know, my experimental groups would be um, when I pump them up with caffeine um, for, I don't, I don't know why I would ever do that. That sounds like a recipe for disaster. All right, moving on. Uh, next is the evidence and analysis section, their data presentation. So this is going to break up into two sections, data presentation and um, data analysis. So data presentation, here you're looking for, you know, do they have data tables? Do they have graphs? Are the data tables on graphs well labeled? Is it clear what is being represented in these um, visual representations of the data, you know, data presentation is just, is the data there or not? And then data analysis, and notice this is the other 10 pointer, um, you're doubling the scores here. Um, here you're looking for, did the student explain their data clearly? Have they noted, um, what their data says? Like, how does that answer the question that they asked? You know, have they identified patterns and trends in their data? Going back to, um, the example that I already regret coming up with, but you know, what does the data say about my kids' heart rates? You know, are they like super elevated after I give them caffeine? You know, do my data tables say that or do they say something else? And so this section, you know, I generally, like when I'm grading one of the students' projects, I'll do these sections together um, because, you know, there's, there's how is the data represented visually and then there's how well does the student explain the patterns and what they see, what they understand from their data. So that is the evidence analysis section, data and data analysis, All right? Rounding things out is the discussion section or almost rounding things out is the discussion section. There's one of my kids right there. The first part is error. Um, the students are reminded that error is inherent in every experiment, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, the example I use is that if there was no error in your experiment, um, the results would be exactly the same every single time. Imagine I am dropping a car down a ramp. If there was no error, if there was no friction, if there was no wind resistance, if there's nothing, there would never be any variation. There would never be any difference um, between my results. And every time I drop the car down, it would take 5.23 seconds or whatever. But of course, this world is full of randomness. And so there's a lot of error. And the students have been talked to have been taught to look for two different types of error. The first is random error, which I just explained. Um, you know, you can't control how the car's wheels handle the friction on the track every time you drop them down. So you're gonna see 
variation, like it's going to fluctuate, it'll be a little faster this time, it'll be a little slower that time, you know, that's random error. Random error is also caused by imprecision in tools, like even if you use a laser guided beam to measure the car time, like that's still not infinitely precise. Um, and so that's another source of error that you might hear students talk about. Systematic error is a little trickier. That's error that affects all the data in the same way. Um, the example I normally use for my students is if, I, if I'm shooting free throws outside and there's a breeze going from right to left, that's going to affect every single shot I take, blowing it from the right to the left. So random error, systematic error, do the students identify it? And most importantly, do they talk about how the errors affected that data? You know, that's like, that's your five pointer here. You know, they want to talk about their sources of error, but then also talk specifically about how that error might have affected the data. The next part of the discussion is, to me, one of the most fun parts uh, of, the ex of the experimental design process, experimental design improvements. This is where students discuss, you know, how they would improve their experiment. Like sometimes, uh, frankly, experiments don't go well. Well, has the student put thought into how to do it better next time, how they could have improved their experimental design, like if they had unlimited money, how would they do it differently, you know, how would they eliminate as much of that randomness um, as they can. So you may see students talking about that for experimental design, or they might talk about, you know, how would they go further? Like how would they, you know, you've done the experiment, what more do you want to know? And what experiment would you design to learn that next uh, thing that you want to know about the same topic? And so, you know, science is an iterative process. Um, you learn something and then you use that knowledge to design a new experiment to learn more. And that's really what this experimental design improvement section is about, you know, how can we use the results that we have to inform further research and study and how can we learn more about our topic. And this is a fun section of the um, science fair presentation to give some of your ideas and some of your suggestions to the experiment, whether uh, to the students, whether it be how to improve the experiment or whether it be, you know, cool things that they could study on top of what they already have studied. Uh, the final section that is kind of the content pieces of the science fair presentation is societal connection and relevance. Generally, you're going to hear them talk about this earlier in the presentation during purpose, um, but they may also talk about it here. And this is also one of those topics that you might, if they didn't talk about it in their presentation, you might need to ask them about it. But really what you want to find out here um, as you're evaluating them is why were they interested in this topic? Is it relevant to society? Can they make connections to, and you know, I always tell the students at the very beginning of the year, you know, you're not, <laughs> you're not solving the uh, climate crisis. You're not uh, changing the world, not yet at least, but what connections can you make to your experiment, to your testable question, uh, between your testable question and real world problems, real world issues. And so, that's what this societal connection and relevance section is about. The final, uh, the final section of the rubric is the, probably the simplest section of the rubric, um, their presentation, their poster board, their oral presentation. Um, and you know, here it's pretty much what you would expect. Like, is their poster board neat? Uh, are there no typos? You know, is it put together well and well organized? And as they're making their presentation, you know, were they professional about their presentation? Were they making eye contact? You know, did they do a good job answering your questions? Were they enunciating? Um, and so, you know, that is what you're looking for, for for poster board and oral presentation. Now, I don't have it here, but at the end of everything, you tally up all the scores and you'll get a score um, out of 70. And, you know, we'll, like I said, we'll take those scores and we use them to help um, assess the students. Um, don't worry. It's not like, uh, you know, please give the students a fair grade and whatever you think they deserve. Um, they're evaluated in multiple, you know, it's a multifaceted evaluation uh, of this science fair and your grades from the rubric are only one part of that. So don't feel pressure. You're not going to, you're not going to ruin anyone's life uh, is, is what I'll say. You know, every student who presents, presents at science fair um, is very much on track uh, to graduation, um, which is, you know, because senior science fair, I, I should have mentioned it at the top, is their science requirement for graduating from Fenway High School. So that's why this is such an exciting time, a lot of positive energy and a lot of fun um, for the students and for you, the judges. 
All right, so uh, I like to end with the same general judging guidelines that I had before. Please give each student the opportunity to meet the rubric standards via their board presentation or answering your questions. So please prompt them if you feel like they missed something. They do start lagging and getting tired towards the end. So you might need to um, give them a little reminder to make sure they haven't missed anything. Please remember to do both sides of the rubric. As I noted, some sections are worth more. That's gonna be double the points. Um, so make sure you do that. And then finally, hopefully this doesn't happen, but if a student is missing from their table, give them a second try later. Um, if they aren't there twice, write zero or missing when you turn in the rubric. If the students nearby them aren't presenting, um, you can also check in with them as well. Because sometimes I, I've told the students, the students have been told, you know, to if they need to use the restroom to tell their neighbors um, so that they can talk about, um, so that they can warn judges who are coming by. All right, so that is the brief overview of the rubric, or actually, it's not that brief. This was pretty long. I, again, um, on behalf of Fenway High School, uh, we really appreciate you volunteering your time um, and your knowledge and your expertise and just um, your yourselves uh, to be part of Fenway Senior Science Fair. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. Um, the students are really excited. Uh, we're really excited for you to see that the work to see the work that they've been doing. So thank you so much again um, for your help. And we just look forward to seeing you on Friday. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a great time. If you have any questions, um, you can email me and uh, I'll be happy to get back to you. Uh, other than that, thank you so much again and have a great night.